Welcome to B2B Marketing Methods. I'm your host, Terry Hoffman, and I'm the CEO of Marketing Refresh. Let's face it, embracing digital marketing is daunting. This podcast was created to make it more approachable. Join me as we talk to CEOs, sales leaders, and revenue growth experts who will share lessons learned and tips from their own journeys. Welcome today to another episode of B2B Marketing Methods. Welcome to everybody. I'm really glad you've tuned in to listen. I have a really special guest with us here today. Her name is Sharon Washington. Welcome, Sharon. Thank you for joining us. Hello. Hello, hello, Terry. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. I hope everybody's really like gotten a really strong cup of coffee next to them because Sharon's going to bring a lot of energy. She is not really known to be a low-key person. She's going to bring some energy today, and I'm really looking forward to this conversation, seeing what we can share with our listeners today. I met Sharon because I personally went through the Goldman Sachs 10K SB program. It's a really cool program that Goldman Sachs delivers through an endowment fund that they have, and the whole intention behind it is to help small businesses grow. It helps the fuel the economy, helps create jobs. And so that's a pretty cool investment. They take you through really like a full kind of mini MBA program that has a great curriculum design behind it. And I was fortunate enough to go through the marketing section with Sharon. And going in, I'm thinking, what am I possibly going to learn in this, right? I've got a marketing agency, but it was so insightful, so helpful. I learned a ton from her and I'm really excited that the audience gets to know her a little little bit more today. She wears multiple hats. Not only does she have like a very diverse wardrobe and a pair of glasses for every occasion, <laughs> she also has that many career paths. And so I'd love it if we could start there. Let's start sure. by kind of talking about all the different places that you take your background in marketing, marketing strategy, all of your expertise in that area, and how do you kind of infuse that into the world? Let's start there. So I am fortunate to be in an industry that communication actually marries with marketing. I got my degree in communication, and I'm actually a professor at Trinity, Washington University, and Temple University, and I teach in their communication departments over 18 years. So at Trinity, which is my alum, I'm an alum of Trinity, Washington, um, I've taught in so many different areas from marketing to communication. And what happened is my career path took me into marketing. So it went from PR to marketing. So 06, I started a business in marketing. I had a degree in graphic design. So I said, let me try this out. And they marry well together. And so I've taken my expertise and I um, built my company, the P3 Solution. And then I still teach. So what happens is each place that I planted it actually is a seed to sow to grow in other areas. So I have marketing stuff that I can share in class. I speak so I can share that stuff that I learned in class and turn theory and practice to my speaking um, thing. So it, I've been very fortunate to actually be in a place where both things kind of fuse really well. Yeah, no, I agree. Because you have all those different experiences, I think from what I observed of you that day and having gotten to know you a little bit better over the the coming months is because you look at things from so many different perspectives, you're able to really put yourself in that kind of marketing owner's shoes very well. Because you're looking at it like, how would you staff this? How would I budget for it? How would I get my message in front of the right audience. You just right. you have a really diverse background in skill sets and knowledge areas that I think really applies today. And the world has become more and more complicated, <laughs> right? It is very, yeah. com- especially with in marketing. Yeah. yeah. And then AI just made it that much more fun. <laughs> There's always something new around the corner, but There's always something new around the corner. Yeah. So, and I, I, I'm going to tell my listeners, she only touched on some of the things as we get into this conversation, I, I'm going to kind of reveal some more things that she's got going on that are very interesting. You're just a really generous person. And I think that's also icing on the cake. 
So let's talk about when you talk to somebody who owns the marketing budget and has that responsibility, particularly on the B2B world, what are some things that you advise them to do to just kind of get started for the first time in the world of marketing? Like how can they get the the ball rolling? So the first thing I try to get my B2B clients to understand is they're no different from B2C. The client is actually a person that runs a company of some sort. So when we split it up, one difference of B2B and B2C is that there's an RFP, a proposal of some sort in the middle. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's the same kind of mindset of how would I sell to this customer? The customer just happens to be responsible for probably multiple thousands of units or hundreds of thousands of units to either be bought or to be sold. So the first thing I often tell my B2B people is to change your mindset and think of it as B2C. And it becomes much more easier because when you think B2B, we're thinking that the process is so complex, right? It's so complex as business to business because we have these so many pieces. And really, there's only one piece other than the proposal. And maybe you have to go through one or two different people to talk to. But other than that, it is really person to person and kind of getting that soul. The other thing that, and I think I told you guys this during the program, is that understanding the difference from marketing and sales. So I have this little saying that I say, PR gets you seen, marketing gets you leads, sales gets you paid. So to understand, especially when we're talking to B2B, my B2B clients usually have even teams of one and two of marketing, but also sales teams. So dividing the responsibility of what marketing is supposed to do versus what sales is supposed to contribute to the process so that you can grow. So those are two really starting points for B2B owners that I believe that they need to know, kind of understanding what they're doing and what's the purpose of the marketing versus sales. And then to understand that really it's a B2C, it's a customer you're selling or buying from a customer. Right. So even if you have multiple people involved in the decision-making process, you have to think about them in their individual roles And then think about what's going to be their pain points, what's going to influence their decisions, just as if they were a consumer, because they're people, right? The two areas you just talked about, that's about mindset, right? That's making sure that you're in the right mindset as you begin the marketing process so that you've got yourself focused in the right way and you've got the right mindset going into it. And I think that's really important. And I, I mean, I really emphasize that because I think For so long, um, certain parts of the B2B space, especially like manufacturing and industrial businesses, they're very sales-driven companies and organizations, right? Rightfully so. You have to have sales in order to, what was your phrase? Make the money. Yeah, you need sales to get paid, but you also need to talk to people in order to sell to people, right? I don't think companies often split the two. So they hire marketers with the idea of selling. Marketers don't sell. In fact, statistically, the marketing department is the first thing that people believe they should get rid of because we spend money. Marketing is a spending function. Sales is a profit function. And if you split the two and understand that, you're buying people to talk to. That's your ROI in marketing. So that's sometimes difficult to swallow because you're going, well, I'm hiring a marketer to get me sales. You're hiring them to get you conversation so you can set your salespeople up to sell. That's what yeah. you're hiring marketing people for. Yeah. I Okay. That's great. That's a such a simple way to break it down because I think it's very easy to take something that is simple at its core and have it become probably more complicated than it needs to be, especially when you're just looking to get started or take some yes. of those first steps, you know? Um. So- what about the development of just a budget? How would you advise? So let's say I've done a little bit, right? Like I've at least built a website. 
so that I have an online presence. I've got our products and services described. <clears throat> we have that core sales tool. But what about kind of expanding beyond that and thinking, all right, what are some things that I should be looking at or considering in, in terms of putting together a marketing budget? So no one wants to spend money on marketing, probably even marketers. Probably you and I, Terry, we don't, we don't want to spend. I start from the sales piece, like thinking about how many people do you need to sell to get to your sales goal? So how many people or companies, how many contracts, how many deals do you have to sign to make your quota or make your money? Now, what that says is that you're going to need eight times as many leads for you to even get that amount of sales. So, so I think that when you think about your marketing budget, you want to think about and how much are you willing to pay for a conversation? Because that's what your marketing IRR should be, that you've had a meeting, right? When I think about my business contract, the contract that I have for my company, I think about all of the flights I've had or the meals I've had to do. All of that is marketing. All of that goes into your marketing budget. So the, the number that they say is five to 20% of your revenue should go to market. Yep. And it's just, I think it's like investing, you know, the more risk you take, the more reward. Right. Right. If we take an example of a large corporation like Coca-Cola, and if I think about the Super Bowl and when they have ads, those ads never say buy Coke. They're not because they're marketing ads. They're there to provide leads and they're paying millions of dollars. So their ROI is not the million dollars that they spent. Mm -hmm. It is the activity that happens. So with the budget, you want to think about how much do you need to spend to get the leads that you want? Are you willing to spend $10 of marketing on each person? So you go, what's that? 20,000, am I getting that right? 20,000? Yeah, I'm in marketing. Right. I need a spreadsheet to plug those numbers into. So in essentially start with the end in mind. Think about what your ultimate revenue goal is or your sales goal and then work back from that to yes. how many conversations is it going to take to get to that? And then how many different people do I need to get in front of to get those conversations to happen, right? So again, exactly. very simple, right? It's, it. <laughs> If, if in execution, it was only this simple, but as far as like putting a framework together though, this is really, in my opinion, how simple you've got to make things so that you don't get in your own way. I think it's very easy to get in your own way. It's scary, right? To invest in something when you're not hundred percent sure what the outcome is going to be. But um, right. one thing that I've learned about the market, especially with the way people like Gen X and Gen Y, they're getting older. They're making decisions now in the B2B world. They're old enough to control the budgets and make the purchasing decisions. And they want the conveniences that they experience in their consumer lives. They want those same experiences when they're being marketed to. And I don't want the companies to do the mistake of comparison. Well, this business, when we do the same amount of revenue, I should be spending X amount of dollars as they are or none. Because sometimes I hear my clients go, yeah, I just do referrals. And I go, well, when they dry up, do you have a plan? No, we'll get to that when it, it hasn't happened in 25 years, 30 years. But as you and I know, the market is volatile. So it could change at any moment. Mm -hmm. I think understanding your customer segments and how to build relationships. Once you understand the budget, where to use your budget is actually nurturing those relationships that are going to get you those contracts you want. Yep. Um, so what are some ways that you can find out? Let's okay. say, I, all right, I've got my budget set. I kind of mm -hmm. know what my numbers are that I'm aiming for. And I, mm -hmm. now I need to identify that target profile, right? My ideal customer profile and then figure out how am I going to reach them? Like, how, how do I get in front of them? What are some methods or some things that you could do to figure those things out? Get those. Answers. Here's something I do 
that has worked. I always talk about closing on social media, especially LinkedIn, 70% of the time, right? So what I would do is actually go to LinkedIn, out, build out my segment. If I'm trying to reach you, Terry, and someone else knows you, instead of me going, hey, let's connect, I'm going to go, hey, one of your friends, do you know Terry? Can you introduce me to Terry? I'm trying to do something new to introduce us to see where I could develop the relationship. That marketing cycle, although maybe I won't get a contract with you for another 12 months, could be six months, depending on your needs, right? Right. Sowing those seeds, and it may seem like many of my business owners are like, that just seems so tedious. How else are you going to get to know people? Yeah. Right. So I'm going high level to high level Mm -hmm. to work that out. And if they go, hey, I'm interested, then I can pass that along to my sales and business development. Like, okay, well, I'm going to have you talk to Sharon, who's going to now help you with how to execute. Okay. But really, I think that our marketing salespeople, your CMOs, your VPs, you really need to start developing relationships, buying relationships that's not selling. Mm -hmm. And I I know that sounds like an oxymoron, but really in this marketplace, because it's so saturated, it's who you know, like, and trust. Right. Oh, absolutely. You know, it's interesting because everything that you just described is exactly what... (laughs) we advise our clients to do. And do you know what happened to me personally? About a year ago, I looked at my LinkedIn connections and realized I'm not even connected in LinkedIn to the market that is so important to me. And because it's who we target for clients that I've got to get connected there, not just for the reason to sell and build that relationship, but also to learn and listen. Right. And so that's another added benefit of using those Mm -hmm. LinkedIn connections is you can then see what people are talking about. And that's where you start to learn the things they're talking about and thinking about. These are the types of comments. These are the types of other people they're following Mm -hmm. so that you get a lot of insight about the things that they're trying to learn about and where they're trying to grow and build. Right. Absolutely. And you can establish yourself as a thought leader in that space, which makes it easier to be able to then have that conversation. This happened last week. I reached out to a large organization. I was like, hey, so you're looking for a Oh yeah, we were going to contact you because we already know who you are. And while that is a big ego boost, that just speaks volumes to me nurturing these relationships because, you know, people could be saying I'm trash. <laughs> but... <laughs> No, fortunately, give, give me their not. names if they're saying that. I need to have a talk with them. <laughs> no, they're not saying that. You really do use LinkedIn. I'll give the audience an example. So if Sean makes a post and I comment on it or like it, she immediately engages with me. We know each other, right? But yeah. on some level, I mean, we've never discussed this, but on some le- level, she's probably thinking, I want to nurture my relationship with Terry because hey, she could have a client who wants me to speak down the road. She could be involved in my nonprofit, which we haven't talked about yet, but there could be multiple opportunities or I may end up knowing someone who needs to know you. And you are very committed to nurturing those relationships when someone engages with you. And I think that's, I'm complimenting you, but I'm also using that as an example that the audience I think can learn from. The apprehensive part of that it's probably time. I get that. It's time consuming. I am a VP. I am a CMO. I have things to do. Well, just like that conversation that you're having, carve out 30 minutes and kind of go through, we should be in a strategy space. And so part of this is kind of understanding to your point, Terry, what does the marketplace want so that I can be able to direct the strategy in the right way to actually pour in those leads. Volume is hard to get these days. Volume of customers. Difficult. I, I guess that's why pricing keeps going up. I'm pretty <laughs> sure that's a macroeconomic thing right? that I can't explain. Yes, but, but, price, no, but that, prices are going up. They are, and that is happening in the market now. <laughs> I guess on a, on a little bit of a tangent is 
because it's hard to get a high volume and and in a B2B industrial manufacturing space, you might be selling a six figure or possibly even a seven figure sale or product. And so keeping that business and then nurturing and growing that relationship, maybe that person would move to another company and be in a similar type right. procurement role, or maybe they would have a new project that pops up and you've got to stay on top, build that relationship and expand upon it as well. Right. Yes. Yeah. I didn't even think of that way, but yes, yeah. that has happened with me with um, some training opportunities. Um, my COO has gone to another space and she's like, yeah, and we want to hire you again, but for this company. Mm -hmm. So yes. Yeah. That happens. So keeping that, that relationship works. active is important. What about picking marketing resources, right? This is huge and very hard. Something I've seen change. I mean, I'm 30 years into my marketing career now. <laughs> a lot has changed, but one of the big ones that changed is we went from traditional marketing where there was no internet, right? Pre-internet. Fax machine. Do you remember that? You faxed oh, yeah. the ad out. <laughs> Definitely. There was that phase of my career. There's like pre-internet and post-internet. Very clear line. <laughs> when that clear line happened and we made that transition, all of these other skills became necessary, right? So how do you determine when you're getting this all underway? Like, what are the resources that are important to begin? And what do I need to look at? Insourcing, outsourcing, how do I build this capability? You don't need to know everything. You don't need to know how to do everything, but you need to know how to get people who need to know how to do those things. So I think the resource is in the people that you select to do what you need to do. Oftentimes, businesses find that they need to be in the know of shiny objects. So I'll give you an example. So pre-pandemic video became very popular. I think during the pandemic, we went into short form video and things like that. Companies go, I need to do this immediately. But you haven't understood what the other pieces, your social media, your content, you haven't mastered that. So my thought about resources is one, get away from shiny objects. So every new thing you don't have to participate in to be successful. Two, choose resources that are going to help you with your goal in the moment because as you and I know Terry the information changes prob probably is changing right now as we speak the social media algorithm is probably changing mm -hmm. but also yesterday this platform was hot tomorrow another platform will be the place to be so kind of understanding what you need in the moment. And moment could be 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, two weeks. But I think what's important with that, to fuse that or to bring that all together is that stop creating marketing plans for years or a year. I think it should be for a project because the marketplace flip-flops. So use resources that will be notable for you in the moment and stop this kind of one fail swoop kind of thing. Yeah. How do you know it's time to make a change or add, add something new in? What are some signs you could be looking for? Oh, perfect. So you have numbers and you have expectations. And let's just say you did a 90 day plan and you said, we want to have a thousand leads in 90 days and 30 days has passed and you have three. How likely within the next 60 days will you get, what is that, 997? You could split a 1,000 in 12 weeks. And on average, if in the two weeks you're not getting the average sales or leads that you're supposed to be getting, it's time to do a change. So change happens, right? It can happen immediately. So let's say if you're using LinkedIn and your plan is to have 10 calls a week and you're only getting three calls a week, then you got to bump up your calls or you got to scrap that because you know you don't have time to do it. So it's a time to assess it. Could be a week, could be two weeks, but I wouldn't wait until you go through the whole process and then try it all over again. 
Right. Yeah. Because you may be dejected. Yeah. And you could look for maybe some iterative changes like, hey, maybe our call to action was out of line or we right. didn't really describe the value of why we wanted them to call well. So maybe looking at even some small changes that could be adjusted if you're not tracking to the end result you wanted in that time period to help. <laughs> right. You. But like you said, try to find somebody who knows how to oversee that area. And then they know who to bring in for each different purpose is really important. We just see a lot in our market that there is like a vice president of sales put in charge mm -hmm. of marketing. And oh, wow. all, of a, okay. all of a sudden they're thinking, well, that's great, but I haven't gotten an opportunity in my career to really learn how the marketing function works. Like what makes it right. Tick? I've worked with that function, but I've never managed that function. And so kind of right. making that first hire is important. And that's, you've gave, given some really good keys to keep in mind there. And then how to work alongside that person that should build into a department, I think is, is also really important. I just see a lot of times people hire somebody <laughs> who is probably very talented, but maybe is entry level. And then there is uncertainty about how to guide. Well, I, well, because I think many companies move into tactics first. Mm-hmm. So they haven't thought about that end goal of sales or how many people will realistically get me to sales and then go even behind that. How do I talk to these people who will then get me sales? They go straight to, you know what? This company down the street is doing this thing. So I'm going to do this thing without even understanding the target segment. Right. So you can't, you can't really properly guide anyone if you're just having them do tactics. I see the trend is a lot of people getting hired for their ability to be creative and to design, but not to strategize. Right. Yeah. And that it's tough for that person to really shine with the great skills they have, unless it's connected to some type of a strategy. And I see that and I, that frustrates me. For the person running that area, because now you have something that could have gone really well, but it might have been misguided and you didn't get what you right. wanted in charge of the revenue generation right. person who took the job, did a great job, but it was misguided maybe. And then the owner or the person that owns the budget, it could be an investor. It could be the owner is like, what just happened to all of that money I spent? The yeah, market is a horrible. I, I, exactly. Right. I, I hear that all the time. Oh, for sure. And guess what? There's a lot of really bad marketers out there, just like every field, right? There are people who don't have the proper approach and ability right. to build that strategy. That's tough. I call that kind of taking over for a bad boyfriend. <laughs> when we have a client who had a bad experience, I'm like, oh, well, we're going to have to come in and teach you what a good boyfriend should be uh, doing. Good boyfriend is, yeah. Taking baggage. on a good date. I guess what other areas do you commonly get asked about? The reason I connected with you during the session you led in New York is because it's like every topic you jump to, I was like, these are all the things that we get asked about, you know, all of the time. And it doesn't matter if it's my neighbor down the street who owns a restaurant. <clears throat> That's not our market, but I get asked by those people all the time, just as personal favors. Or if it's somebody who is in our target market, they have the same questions, right? How do I budget for this? How do I get started? How do I find the right resources? What are some other big things that you get asked a lot that I maybe um, haven't covered? How much money should I spend in social media? Oh. Should I? The, <laughs> yep. I get that question. That question I get a lot. And I tell them, I don't spend any ad money on social media, but it does take me time. So I am still factoring my time as a cost to use in social media. There's some industries, some companies who have high success just posting ads using social media. So I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't. I'm going to tell you, do you have the capacity and as are your customers clearly there because you shouldn't be doing maybe marketing? It shouldn't be, maybe this will happen if I do this. So sample it, 
give as much money as you would as a sample, no foul, no, no harm, no foul, and see if it works for you in the spaces. I read an article, and I wish I would have been able to give you the title because it's a good article, where Gen Xers are the most consumers on social media, where Gen Z, millennials and Gen Zs are not. They use it, but they don't consume. That has since changed, right? Since the inception of TikTok. So like, I would say if you're a manufacturer, you may not find yourself while you're on TikTok. You could be on TikTok because you're trending for, say, employees. So, so think outside the box on how to use social media in different ways and not just think I should throw money to ads. I guess that's where I'm getting to. So if you're thinking you should throw money to ads, I'm going to tell you to rethink that and think how you can better use social media to kind of either build your visibility or build some type of lead generation. Yes. Well, and you said something about employees too. So there are a lot of industrial companies that they're competing right for employees and so showing more about your company culture and what's going on what it's like to work there what kind of projects you're going to work on using social media to do that can be really valuable like that's a different type of marketing investment or communication strategy your goal might not be building your brand and getting conversations for sales it might be getting conversations for your hr team or your recruiter absolutely to get better quality employees. Have you seen this? And I'm all about fun. There's a TikTok page that I follow on HR. I'm not even in HR, but it gives me ideas about marketing. The two guys singing about I a- love HR. That. Yes. <laughs> well, probably because it's like our music too. They're always doing a song where I'm like, yes, I remember dancing to that. Yes. <laughs> Back when I could dance so, and not look like an idiot, but yeah. You can that, dance. No, we, we still got it. We still got it. Too. So, so yeah. I look at that and I get ideas like, how could I do that for marketing, right? Like they would be a hit at conferences to open up conferences. Yeah. We have to think about our target segment. Again, they're active individuals or active companies. <clears throat> that short attention spans, lots of deadlines. How do we attract them? Yeah. And so it may not always be in the ad because I always pose this question. How likely is it for you as a company to buy services from somebody who just posts an ad on Facebook? It's not likely. Mm-hmm. It's not likely. Yeah. I, the way we've seen those kind of ads work is just, you know, it might take 10 to 15 touch points from marketing yeah. to really build that awareness and get people to remember who you are and connect the dots on it. So I think it can be part of an overall strategy, but it would be very tough to argue that any type of social media ad got you <laughs> the customer, right? Immediately. Yeah. Immediately. That's a good, good add on word there. Yeah. I mean, yeah. your salesperson is going to get you the business, right? Yes. <laughs> so I, that's yeah. my take on it. And that's why I like to be in marketing because it's, <laughs> it's pressuring me to say, hey, here's the conversation. Salespeople do you magic. Okay. Well, that brings up a different topic that I love to talk about. How do you have that conversation between the people who are doing their magic and bringing in the money <laughs> and... <laughs> Those of us over here who look like we're just having all kinds of fun every day, right? Man. Marketing is actually can be pretty stressful. We're not curing cancer. We're not saving lives or anything over <laughs> here. But we do have to make sure that we're serving the salespeople and that we're supporting right. them. So how do you, what are some things that you see that make that relationship successful so that there's oh. good communication in place? You need a whistle and a black and white shirt <laughs> and to <laughs> Signals yes. So it is establishing the lane from the beginning. It is going, here is where you stop and we begin. 
Mm -hmm. What I think happens on both sides of the spectrum is I see how I could do your job better. Maybe formulate it to here's how you can help me with my job. It's a change in mindset about the purpose of both sides. You're both needed. Marketing and sales, both of those departments are needed. I firmly believe that. Like, and as a marketer, I like to keep the conversation going. I'm building the relationship. Whereas the salesperson is going, I need to build the relationship because you're not going to sell. You're just going to keep on making it fun. So it's kind of saying, here is where your job stops and my job begins. And making hard stops on that. After you've had this third call and you think they're ready to get sold, it's time to bring them to me or second call, or even first call. So yep. if you have your first or second touch point, send them on to me. Yeah. Boy, that's getting harder and harder. I love that because again, if you create a framework for it, now you have something to start with, but you can also be better at deciding when there's like, no, this particular situation, I need you to stay involved longer than what yeah, yeah. Our, our standard is. It's easier than to use that as the starting point and then figure out from there. But I'm seeing those lines get more and more blurred cross. every day. Yeah. Now they really cross over. Going to a conference or an event is a great example. You have, okay, the marketing department's going to secure the booth space. They're going to pick it. They're going to set up the booth. They're going to make sure all the flyers and cards and all that stuff gets shipped there on time. Right. But now if the people who are coming into the booth don't have time to talk to the salesperson, they didn't engage. How are you, how are you following up on that? Is that solely up to the salesperson? The marketing piece is that there has to be a launch party of some sort, right? This is what we're sending out. Here's the message based on this particular segment. It's about having the freedom for both. Here's the messaging that we've come up with. You can use it in any way you choose to. You need to be more creative. I think what happens is marketers become territorial. I oh, understand this. Yeah. We've been, yeah. both of us are close to 30 years in this space, right? You were very territorial. Why didn't you give us a message the way I, mm -hmm. I said it? It's this, it's the, not and, right? And instead, kind of going, here's, use it the way you want to be creative. The problem comes with the return on investment. So what I think the return on investment should be for marketers is how many leads you brought in, right? with the messaging that you have and not being able to be told because this pointing fingers this way. We didn't sell because your messaging didn't make sense. And we didn't sell because you don't know how to sell this messaging. That's the, that's the core problem. But yes. it needs to be, we are here to get you leads. So this piece is going to get people in your space. We're going to count how many people this beautiful booth got, got people to come. Mm -hmm. That's our success marketing. Your success is how many sales calls you got. Mm -hmm. You have to find spaces where one stops and one begins so that you can count or have ROI based on your position, if that makes sense. No, it, it completely does. I can't. I think there are still a high percentage of companies that don't even have that conversation at the beginning, right? And so then everybody's very wrapped up in their own area, what they think is their own area. And then you get there and you haven't established those ground rules or those boundaries or those rules. I had a guest on maybe a month or so ago and I loved, he told me the way he engages with his marketing team. And I was like, okay, maybe not the way I would have advised. But it doesn't right. matter because it works for them. Yes. It works for them and it's successful. And no matter where you see those lines crossing, there's a lot of gray area in there. There's so many lines getting blurred. There's so much crossover and roles. <clears throat> really, it kind of doesn't matter at the end of the day. As long as you define them, you discuss them, you're clear on them. And if they work for you, 
then do it. I also think it takes, it takes stress. So as a marketer, I don't have to think about the ROI or ROI of did it sell. Mm -hmm. I no longer have to think about that. I did my job, right? But if marketing and sales could find a way to actually collaborate and compromise, and I think the question is always going to be, what do you need from me to help you succeed on both ends? If that is the question that you have, in that ending and starting point. Okay, so I, I have this. Does this messaging help you do what you need to do? We need to sell to this type of customer to do this, right? Does this help? I think both parties will feel included in the process. Now, everything isn't always perfect, but they'll feel included in the process and it's a collaborative effort. Yeah. And then they'll know, he, you know, here's my goal. Well, I need to get five sales calls. So I need this to have at least 15, 20 people are attracted to this so that I can be able to sell this for my sales call. Yeah. No, I love that. I felt like a little bit of ther therapy there when you said both teams, need, <laughs> both sides need to collaborate because that is what it comes down to. And that collaboration just needs to work the way that it works to work for you. <laughs> Yeah, However it works. I, I would even say in companies, just ask them, do you want the line to begin for you? Because that it could be, you want me to get the sales calls for you. And then I just give you the sales calls and you do your magic. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's still very measurable. Right. And yeah. clear, it's measurable. Exactly. And it a lot of that can evolve with the company, <laughs> depending on the skill sets you have on the team, right? You might have this great closer on the sales team. Right. And hey, make sure that person can spend as much time closing as possible. Then you might have another person who's great at that kind of nurturing educational stage of the sales process, then get them then in that them. in there, right? Like build on those strengths, play on them. Yeah. Or you might have someone who are so crafty that they can build out the vision. So you just tell them the vision. They aren't good with kind of talking to people, but they can create a vision. Yep. Yeah. No, I love that. Well, wow, we covered a lot. It felt like five minutes passed and it was a lot more than that. <laughs> I have like a few fun questions I always ask at okay. the end. Go ahead. Um, yes. The first one is, um, do you find yourself like, is there a book you have read in your life or that you just read recently that you just find yourself recommending? Yes. Okay. Poised for Excellence by Karima Mayama Arthur. Now, she is actually my unofficial mentor. She's a very good friend of mine, like okay. a sister. But her book, even if she wasn't, changed my elevation game tenfold. Um, it is a leadership book about how you poise yourself for excellence. Okay. And it talks about leadership in very different ways. It's a very easy read it's a space where you can pull things out like it's no oh, and this isn't even like it's right here okay so it, it's a, it's a very easy read um it's motivational it has affirmations in it but it also has exercises and information that is poignant okay, okay. i love that all right good this is like my little hack for building my reading list by the way Oh, no, worse than, no, you, you want to get this one. You want to, okay. and I'll get it signed for you if you. Oh yeah. That'd be awesome. Especially since she's a friend and, and all that. Right. Yeah, no, I'll, okay. So I'll look that one up. Okay. Um, my next question is what's like your favorite trip that you've ever taken? Italy 2022. I went to Benale Arte, um, and me and my best friend went on a girl's trip. Mm -hmm. uh, my husband didn't want to go. He said, no, it's like, we. What we went? Okay, well, I'm I going. know <laughs> we went Rome, Florence, and Venice. We get into Venice, no plans. Arte, Arte Benali, and I'm probably messing it up, but okay. it's contemporary art. It is acres of like they have mini pavilions for each country with contemporary art. It just so happened the U.S put their first black woman installation in this space. Her name is Simone Lee. 
amazing. It was an incredible exhibit. Um, and I'm glad that we got to see it. So Italy 2022. Italy is beautiful, by the way. Food, delicious. Italy was it. We stayed across the street from the Coliseum. Um, it's yep. really, really nice for Italy. Um, by the way, I just got back from Italy exactly one month ago to get today. I was wow. just, there. yeah, my husband okay. and I, my husband and I and our <laughs> oldest daughter and her husband went there this oh, July see, together. Nice. It was so, it was so fun. I love Terry, that. when I see you and I know grandma's coming, I don't, you look so young. You know, well, I know the way we're in the same area, but I look so young. Okay. Same for you. When I told you I was going to become a grandmother and you were like, welcome to the club. I was like, what? How do you have a grandchild? That doesn't even make sense to me. Yeah. Our kids are 30, 31. Oh, okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. Italy. I totally, I do you know what's really kind of silly? I loved going there so much that we left and I was like, I'm really disappointed because I just don't think I could ever take a trip that good again. <laughs> it was so fun. Look, I, yeah. I'm, I'm trying Spain next year, but it, oh, I want to okay. go back again to it. Like Italy has to be like a regular trip. Like I would Orlando or yeah. Las Vegas. That's how much I loved it. All right. Yeah. Well, that's very cool. Um, <laughs> This will be a fun one. What? If, okay. if there is any musician, um, solo artist, doesn't matter, group or, or soloist, dead or alive, who you could see in concert, even if you saw them before, I don't care. Like, who would that person be? Okay. Or group? Hmm. This is a good one. I would have said to you in the pandemic, Michael Frank. A jazz artist, but I saw him. I checked him off my bucket list. But I've never seen in concert Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. So if I could, yeah, if I could see Michael Jackson in concert, absolutely. And then I'm going to cheat a little bit, but like a medley of 80s pop. Like I am a Thomas Dolby kind of ever kind of. <laughs> <laughs> if I could see kind of 80s pop ZZ Top, um, if I okay. could see them all in one, Duran Duran, if I could see them all in one concert. Yeah. Yes. See, this is how you know you're talking to somebody who grew up on MTV just like you did. Yes. Because yes. we just watched all those videos. You named everyone. Oh, um, yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. You just sit there and waited for Thriller to come on when they told you it's coming oh on at goodness. 10 32. You sat there and, and waited. You were like <laughs> 17 so minutes till Thriller comes on. I waited so every good. time. So funny. I waited. I waited. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Like glued. Like, don't anybody talk to me. I can't miss <laughs> this. <laughs> They'll never understand right. that you can't, like, we couldn't record anything back then. You, had you can't to DVR it. You couldn't. <laughs> Either you saw it and you were able to talk about it at school or you didn't and you no. weren't. I'm going to look up Michael Franks. That is not an artist I've heard of. He's a jazz oh. musician, you said? Oh, he's a jazz musician. He's, okay. He has to be 78, close to 80. Short guy. My friends laugh at me because it's like elevator jazz. Have you heard of Diana Krall? Oh, yes. -R -A -L -L. yes. Oh, yeah. So, so oh, it's like that. More okay. like her. It's okay. like that. And so, yeah. so they laughed at me, but I screamed. He got on stage. I screamed like a child. Uh, and the audience was singing it. He gets sold out. It's so he's a really good, good oh, sound. Okay. I'll have to check that out. So if you had to name the best job you've ever had, what would that be? Oh, the best job I've ever had. Mm -hmm. I'm in it. I'm actually in it uh, today. Okay, which one? <laughs> I, which one are you in? True. <laughs> ha! You got me. You got me. Well, you um, like the diversity. You like the range. I like the range and the okay. freedom. And I like it that I have everything that I want. I can be creative. There's structure. Um, I can be impactful. And so what I like most probably would be teaching at Trinity because I'm giving back to 
a, a population that honestly, I went to back to school when I was in my late 20s, so like 28, 29, okay. and I had had a child. And so I went back to school and I wasn't a traditional student and it helped me find my voice when the, the school helped me find my voice. So to give that back and seeing the young people get there, they're like, oh, Professor Washington, we love you. We want to be you. I like your style. I like what you do. Um, awesome. To them finding their voice actually makes me happy. Yeah. It sounds like it's brought it full circle for you and your purpose in that, in that role. What, maybe that's a good segue too, to have you talk about your nonprofit that you've okay. created. I, I really want you to talk about that. So as I was building my business and coming into the ranks of all these things, I had no path. There was no director. So there's nobody to say, Hey, come Sharon, this is the way you go. Do you want to do this? This is what you should do. <laughs> and I find that teaching, I teach young women, um, minority women, I teach like all types of women I teach mm -hmm. at Trinity. It's predominantly women's school. And I noticed that they didn't have strategy either. And no one is saying here, you could be everything you want to be. You just need to be able to pass to streamline it out. On top of having barriers, economic, domestic violence, et cetera, et cetera, right? Barriers to getting to where you need to go. I was like, let me create this nonprofit organization called Discovering Butterflies. And it it's twofold. It's actually an adjective and a verb. So we're always, we ourselves are always discovering butterflies. So we're always discovering, always trying to find our path. <clears throat> and the organization actually discovers butterflies. So we take them through this 12-week step of identity and building strategy, and then mentor matching that helps them open doors to get to where they need to go to. So they have to be in between the ages of 18 to 25. Okay. Um, because I think that that is the space where we decide that they can do whatever they want. We're like, mm, they got it. They have to apply. Um, it's national. So it's just not in my local space. Um, okay. It's a virtual program for now. Our first cohort starts in October. But I've already been working with these young women at school. So I just know this is going to be great. Um, our first mentor is Angela Scott. She is the owner of the office of Angela Scott, a million dollar shoe company on the West Coast. Um, she is one of our mentors um, and the mentors, they open doors. So this is not one of those programs where you're just going to meet a mentor and it's like, hi, no, they're going to really help you and provide opportunities for you to get where you need to go. So I love that. Um, yeah, I, I yeah. built it. I love it. How do you, so it's going to be uh, like, there's a curriculum involved with bringing them through the program. What do you, yes. what does your curriculum focus on? Like what are kind of some of the points? So identity, mm -hmm. um, strategy setting. So understanding. So we go from developing who I am, resume, they get a makeover, all types of stuff, wow. wherever they are. Okay. So we have, yes. Um, and so then we move into more of building this strategy. So it's all these four phases of a butterfly from cocoon oh. to actually flight, right? Got it. So, and they may not complete what they will complete. They'll end with the result of having a executable strategy. So they may not complete what they have to do in 12 weeks because it could be different types of things, right? Mm-hmm. But once they complete, it's a wraparound program. They could come back and get different resources. So, excuse me, I'm working on the opportunity for them to actually go across the world to actually network with different possible mentors, job opportunities, et cetera. They get to pick what they want to do. So out, so the part of it is go ahead, list out 10 things that you want to do forever. What are you feeling that you love? And then we look at what's realistic for them to achieve and match a mentor with that that could help them achieve that specific thing. Okay. So it's interesting listening to that, just having gone through the Goldman Sachs 10KSB program. 
it sounds sort of like a mini version, not even a mini it version. Is. It's, it's, it's the same, same components, but different purpose in mind and um, probably like a little bit of a different group because they don't have to be, but like they're not business owners going into it. They're not business yeah. owners. No, yeah. it is the same idea. Think about yeah. growth opportunity and Goldman Sachs. Yes. Yeah. So they're, yeah. they, they develop a growth opportunity and build a strategy marketing plan to get to it That's and then awesome. go off and do it. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I love that. I'm, I think it's awesome. I have definitely told you through LinkedIn, I would love to be involved. So if there's an opportunity, you can. I, would, I definitely want to support is. you in that. Yeah. I'm always looking for mentors. I know I'm going to have a ton of young women that believes they want to go into small business. The, mm -hmm. Another thing is that they're building this strategy to figure out if they really do. They, they may come to a space where I don't want to do. This is not what I want to do. Yeah. Which is good. That's a good thing. It is good. And I think that's one of the most important things about that age is explore, right? Like, yeah, let allow yourself some space to talk to a lot of different people who do a lot of different things. Um, because I don't know, I, I raised three girls through that stage and only one of them knew I know what I want to do with my life. That's rare. right. right. I don't think that's common. Right. My I don't kids think that's didn't. Common. Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. yeah, I think yeah, the other no. two were more like I. I don't know what to do, right? So then I try to guide them to like, here's a bunch of people you could talk to, because they don't want to talk to their mom or dad about that. They want to talk to <laughs> experts. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Isn't it just the weirdest thing? And I give recommendations. My husband's like, just chill out a little bit. I'm like. <laughs> No, but I know. I'm, and I happen to be in my son's industry. He's in the events industry. I'm in the events oh, and man. I speak. And he yeah. knows people that I know, but he won't let me. He won't yeah. let me. He won't See, let me. I have to tell yeah. my husband all the time, I don't have a chill out button. That one doesn't exist. I can't chill out. Yeah, I, can chill. I can't chill yeah. out. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> well, um, thank you so much for joining me today. I know... I know you're already into like Friday evening now at recording time. <laughs> um, I really appreciate you coming on and being generous with your time. If there's a quick way people can get in touch with you, if they're interested in connecting with, what would you suggest? So if you want to, LinkedIn is always the easiest way. Sharon Washington, just send me a message. Hey, how you doing? Saw you on the, on the podcast with Terry. Um, or or uh, Instagram which is the SW life. And that's where I show my life 360. So you get to see all the glasses and all the outfits. And the shoes have, and the outfits, yeah. 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 I have affiliate relationships, marketing oh, affiliate okay. relationships with the shoes and the glasses. Um, so it is it is business too. I've turned my fun into business. business <laughs> I don't want to post did. anyway. So I like, know. why not? Um, so you could follow me there as, okay. um, SW life and I'm on TikTok, but you know, don't judge me on TikTok. <laughs> TikTok just, I try to keep up with my students. I'm to oh. stay current in the TikTok space. So I'm doing TikTok dances, um, and things like that. It's, it's pretty fun. So oh, check well, me out there too. I'm going to be checking that out. That'll be funny. <laughs> That'll be good entertainment. Yeah. No. Yes. Like I said, thanks again. I really appreciate it. Guys, reach out to Sharon if you want to, if you want to connect more. Um, we probably only touched on maybe like 50% of the ways they might be interested <laughs> in engaging with you. But I would say for sure, if looking for a really dynamic speaker for an event, I would definitely connect with Sharon. Oh, just come talk nice. to me. If you need a yeah. resource, so you want to drop some ideas, I'm definitely helpful in that area too. Well, thank you. Enjoy and enjoy the, your weekend. Thank you. Thank you for listening to B2B Marketing Methods. Please be sure to follow us on your favorite podcast channel and leave us a review. We'd love to hear from you and connect. You can find me on LinkedIn or visit our company website at marketingrefresh.com.